All right. We're excited to have Rachel, or Rachel and Jenny Mae with us here today. It's possible this is the first time you've seen them, but you will most certainly recognize their voices. Um, Rachel Hubbard is the executive director at KOSU, serving Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Stillwater. Uh, she grew up in Washita County and started her radio career at the age of 16, reading obituaries for KTJS in Hobart, <laughs> which I hope we get to hear a little bit about that, too. <laughs> Um, she stumbled into public radio after college and deciding that shredding paper wasn't really the path that she wanted to a job. Rachel rose through the ranks at KOSU and has done a little bit of everything at the station except engineering. Along the way, she has done a pretty decent job at journalism, I would say so, and a lot of collaboration. The most recent collaboration was with WNYC Studios and the History Channel. Blind Spot, Tulsa Burning, won a DuPont Columbia Award and was a finalist for the Peabody Award. Rachel is married to a great guy who supports all of her crazy ideas, and they live in Oklahoma County with their three sons, a small apiary, which is a beehive, and a biting donkey. So please join me in welcoming Rachel. It's so good to be here with you all today. Um, I am a Payne County girl at heart. Uh, I married a guy, uh, as it said in my bio, who owns a business. Um, in North Oklahoma City and Edmonds, and uh, so, you know, he thought I should move there uh, to be to be with him. So I did, uh, and it also happened to be about the same same time that KOSU was opening a studio in Oklahoma City. Prior to that, uh, we'd burned a lot of tires up um, between Exit 174 and the Oklahoma State Capitol. Um, where we were reporting. So if you're not familiar with KOSU, I'm not gonna make uh, a ton of assumptions. Um, KOSU went on the air December 29th, 1955, on a light pole at the corner of Orchard and University. Um, and since then, it has expanded multiple times. Um, we were the first NPR station um, that was licensed in the state of Oklahoma. And um, currently, we have the largest broadcast footprint our footprint covers about two thirds of the state of Oklahoma. Um, but at this point in 2020, I'm st still struggling with 2023. In 2024, um, we uh, serve about 500,000 people every single month. The majority of those are in a digital space and we have people who consume information um, via email newsletters, podcasts, radio, text message, Instagram, Facebook, uh, yeah, linked to like so many, so many things. And what we have figured out is that um, you have to go to them. So that's uh, what we're doing. Um, so I tell people all the time that we're more than a radio station um, because at, that, at this point in time, that is absolutely true. So the thing that I'm gonna talk to you about today is something that we think about all the time. It's the information ecosystem. Um, people ask me all the time, like what's going on with my local paper? Why is the news so terrible? What do we do about local news? Or I don't subscribe to my paper anymore. I'm not a member of a nonprofit news outlet um, because it, you know, I just don't find anything of value in there. And there is um, functionally the local news and information system, which is the information system that provided a lot of social cohesion in much the same way that Rotary does. Um, I'm a Rotarian. Um, I'm a member of Rotary Club 29 in Oklahoma City. Um, in much the same way that Rotary does, it provides that social cohesion. And so local news has historically been uh, the record of births and deaths and sporting events and uh, community successes and failures and opinion pieces where we could agree and disagree. And perhaps some people think that is lost. And on the national level, that may be true. But in much the same way that Rotary does, the difference that we're making in local news and info or in news and information is oftentimes on the local level. We can't change something that is that is huge, but we can change things that are here in our community. So I'm going to talk to you about the information ecosystem. Um, so uh, more journalism jobs. Everybody's heard about coal mining um, and the number of jobs that have been lost. More journalism jobs have been lost since 2005 than coal mining jobs. We've lost 43,000 nationwide. Most of those losses have come at metro and regional daily papers, much like the Stillwater News Press. Uh, the Oklahoman, for example, in 2005 had over 120 people in their newsroom. Today they have fewer than 20. Um, and so that is um, what is happening is that we're in this very much triage space of journalism. 
Most of these are now owned by the 10 largest newspaper chains. Um, don't know how many of you know who owns uh, the local newspaper, assuming that you live in Stillwater. Uh, so the Stillwater News Press, um, the Enid paper, the Norman paper, the Ardmore paper, and several others. Um, CNHI is one of these 10 largest daily chains. Um, and so that, you know, I just encourage you to pay attention to what is happening in your local community. Um, not a judgment call on what the people at the news press are doing, uh, but you should watch these 10 largest uh, chains. They employ a fifth of the people uh, collectively that they did in 2005. A quarter of the newspapers in this country have already shut down and an average of two a week right now are closing their doors. Um, throughout, this paper, throughout this presentation, I've dumped in um, some pictures of our reporters who are doing their work. Uh, Jenny May was like, you need more pictures. So uh, these are some of the people that we work with every day. Um, on a bright spot, KYC's newsroom is expanding. Um, and it is because of people in our community. Some of you I know are members of KOSU, um, but these are some of our reporters and collaborators that we work with um, at a community forum that we did last year in Pawhuska. Um, the state of things in Oklahoma, three counties are already what we call news deserts, which means that there's no local news source in, um, in that county. Uh, most of those are in Western Oklahoma. In the 2023 state of local news report, 16 other uh, counties have been placed on a watch list to lose their only local news source. In the state, we've lost about 430 journalism jobs, and that translates into 63,000 fewer stories every single year about local elections, sporting events, picture, you know, pictures, opinion columns, because there's no one to edit them or uh, submit them, um, and various other things. We've lost 78% of our journalism capacity, and only three states, Louisiana, Illinois, and New Jersey, have lost a higher proportion of their journalists than we have. Uh, this is Robbie Korth, KOS, who's uh, news director um, with a student project that we did last year. Um, and so what does all this mean? The dual loss of newspapers and journalists has impacted the way that information flows through our country. Uh, there, it has all kinds of pretty terrible effects that have been studied. This is no longer considered a phenomenon. Um, it's now documented and has been studied in, in all sorts of ways. There's less social cohesion. People are more likely to live in food deserts. They're more likely to live in internet deserts. They're about 20% less likely to vote, especially in off-cycle elections. Um, and the thing that I find crazy every single time is that if there's, lo if there's no local journalist in uh, uh, city council meetings, in county commission meetings, and things like that, in those news desert counties, their bond rating goes down which typically results in higher taxes in those communities. Um, this is one of our, uh, our ag and rural affairs reporter. Um, a news desert is a civic desert. Triage journalism with the few, uh, few people that we have left, um, it, they follow the sirens. And so people are like, why is the news so negative? And it's because you know, they just get to cover the dumpster fire um, and that is what is left. Um, the rise of ghost papers. A ghost paper is a sort of byproduct um, of the news deserts. They haven't totally collapsed, but they have lots of times these papers um, owned oftentimes by these 10 largest chains don't have a single reporter in their newsroom. They may still have an office that's in a downtown, you know, in a downtown area or something like that, but they're not really covering things and they're oftentimes sharing reporters across multiple county areas. And with no credible and relevant information, um, you're seeing exactly what we're seeing, um, which is that people have a steady diet of social media content um, that's often really heavy on national news um, and has very little relevant information on things like water, um, local elections, um, and, and various other things. Uh, this is Anna Pope. She's one of our reporters. Uh, she is with a, a program called Report for America, which is wor works much like Teach for America, and uh, they give us matching money so that we can add reporters faster than we would have been otherwise because we're a nonprofit um, to our newsroom. And Anna is one of our Report for America core members. So the way that uh, the ecosystem should work is that there's a really big base of freelance and citizen journalists. These are the people who submit opinion columns. There are people who used to write those things that are like 
Mary Sue went to, you know, Gwen's house for pink salad and so and so got married and, you know, this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, what, why do you need that? You know, social media does that. Um, and it's a historical record. Oftentimes these are places where people do genealogy research. It's where they look for histo historical context um, and various other things. So that would feed up into a weekly and regional paper, and that would feed up into the state daily paper. And then we would go to sort of regional newspapers like the Chicago Sun-Times or things like that. And then up into uh, the big national news outlets, would, which would be things like NPR, NBC, or Fox, or whatever. And so it was this interdependent ecosystem where oftentimes individuals or people at the smallest news outlets would notice things and then send them up. Probably the most recent example that most people are familiar with is the Flint water crisis, where somebody was like, something is weird in Flint, Michigan. Why do we care about Flint, Michigan? Uh, and so they sent it, you know, and then it went to the state news outlet, uh, and then it went higher up, and then it became a national story that we're all familiar with. And so that's an example that many people are uh, understand. And that that system right now is broken because there are just not enough people in it. <laughs> yes, yes, you're absolutely, you have, a, that's a great example. Uh, so how do we fix it? Uh, things are not doomed, um, but it's changing. Like this, uh, as, as with many things in our lives, we're in a state of disruption. So what do we do about it? Uh, the th question that I uh, don't necessarily have an answer to, but it's something that I think about a lot, is, is journalism and local news and information a commodity to be bought and sold? or is it a civic good? Um, and if it's a commodity, then we're dependent entirely on subscriptions and whether or not people are buying and selling information, whether they're buying and selling your eyeballs, or is it something that should exist um, like a library or like a public pool or a park or you know many of the other things that we understand. Even if your local news outlet is not something that you agree 100% with, even if it is not something that you read every day or that you listen to or that you watch, I would encourage you to subscribe. Because what happens with many of these um, hedge funds and uh, investment uh, groups that own many of these local news outlets is the way that it works is that they buy local news outlets that have some downtown property um, that's pretty nice and they will, the Edmund Sun, um, what was the Edmund Sun is a prime example. If you're familiar at all with Edmund, it's on the corner of Broadway and Second Street, corner real estate downtown. Uh, the Edmund Sun closed in 2020, and uh, it, the, the outlet that bought them, um, they, they made some efficiencies. And then uh, the, the efficiencies included a reduction in the number of reporters, so there were fewer stories. So fewer people subscribed because they found less value in it. And then because fewer people were subscribing, there were less eyeballs to read the paper, and then um, they lost advertising dollars. And then it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy. So fewer reporters, fewer subscribers, less advertising, which means fewer reporters, fewer subscribers, less advertising, until it's not sustainable, and then the outlet that owned them uh, sold the real estate for a very handsome profit downtown, and Edmund no longer has um, a local news outlet. You can be an influencer. You can share credible content. Um, lots of times I say that you know there's this never-ending diet on social media, um, and many people are familiar with sharing things, um, e whether it's on social media or it's at things like Rotary or whatever. You can share that content uh, with your friends and neighbor neighbors and let them know that local journalists are doing this work um, and that is often helpful. Or you can consider becoming a citizen journalist. Um, by citizen journalist, we mean somebody who would write the article about Mary Sue, you know, going over to Thelma's for the pink salad or whatever it is and giving that, um, or if it's a birth announcement or, um, you know, a wedding announcement or something about a local sporting event um, or things that you may see that are happening in your neighborhood or community. These papers and local news outlets oftentimes are starving for content and they would really appreciate your submissions. Um, these are some of our volunteers plus John Wayne. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what is KOSU doing? Um, I already told you that we serve about 500,000 people a month. We, uh, in 2019, had two journalists. We recognized what was happening 
and we feel like we're licensed to Oklahoma State University uh, because of the university's land grant mission, because of our status as a nonprofit. There's never a paywall between people and our content. Um, we really feel heavily the burden of that public service mission and that we needed to do something to help people access news and information. So we've grown um, through increased fundraising and programs like Report for America uh, and partnerships with many people just like you who have become members of the station um, through financial contributions, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, welcome to the world of nonprofit. Uh, we've grown it from two journalists to eight. We share that content oftentimes with local newspapers, um, with other nonprofit news outlets. We just wanna make sure that the information that we're reporting is out there as widely as possible for people who need it. Um, we are educating, doing things like this. We're educating people about the issue. Oftentimes people have no idea. They think uh, there's a real polling that's been done in the last two years to show that upwards of 85% of Americans believe that media outlets are flush with cash. Um, I am here to tell you that that is not true. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're not getting rich. Uh, many of us, uh, you know, I tell people all the time that uh, you don't go into journalism for the money. Um, so we're becoming more efficient with collaborations, things like Harvest Public Media. Harvest Public Media is a nine state collaboration that we're involved in um, to report on agriculture and rural affairs. So we share an editor with the stations from nine other states and that person is uh, able to help us be more efficient. We're creating a pipeline of young journalists to fill the gap with things like Next Generation Radio. Next Generation Radio um, actually has Stillwater roots. Uh, Doug Mitchell, who was Earl and Bernice Mitchell's son, is an OSU alum and actually a KOSU alum. He uh, took his uh, letter of recommendation and talked his way into NPR in uh, the late 1980s and I would believe that he could do that. Uh, he talked his way into NBR in the late 1980s. About 10 years later, he started what we know as Next Gen, uh, and Next Generation Radio was to bring voices from unexpected places into the media sphere. Uh, we typically host a Next Gen project once a year here in Oklahoma and then try to create a pipeline. It's a week-long boot camp uh, where journalists, uh, top-tier journalists from around the country come in and spend a week with those um, students mentoring them. It's basically a stand-up newsroom for a week. And then following that, we, uh, we try to hire those people. We've hired several of them over the years. Uh, we, we share content with small and rural news outlets. There was an issue last year uh, in Altus um, that was actually a water issue. The, their water supply became, um, I don't know that I want to use the word contaminated, but became uh, discolored. Yeah. Uh, they had a, um, an infestation, I guess, of manganese, um, which is the active ingredient in Gatorade. Um, however, this didn't look much like Gatorade. Um, it looked a lot, uh, it smelled horrible. It was yellow. Um, it looked like someone forgot to flush the toilet. It was just gross. And people were like, hey, is this safe? And the city didn't really have any way to communicate. Uh, the paper didn't have, uh, they were putting some stuff on Facebook, but it wasn't getting out far and wide. Uh, the Altus Times didn't have a reporter who could go figure out what was happening. So one of our reporters, actually, that we hired from Report for America, we get thousands of messages every year via text message, and the most common theme that we got um, was about water, water quality, water quantity, access to water, things like that. So we made a leap, we hired a reporter to focus on water, and she went down there with some manganese test strips and helped a guy test his water in the Brahms parking lot. And uh, we were able to do these explainer videos and things like that, and the Altus Times republished the entire story and just said, thank you. We didn't have any way to explain to people in the city what was going on. Um, and we're also seeking new partnerships and innovation all the time. As some of you know, um, we have, uh, we're moving into a different building in Oklahoma City. Someone has purchased a building on our behalf. Um, I know, it's amazing. Um, and we have to raise the money to put the guts inside of it, but uh, it's a little bit bigger than what we need, but we're bringing in partners from Investigate Midwest, Read Frontier, um, and some other uh, outlets that we're trying to seed as startups, uh, like Focus Black Oklahoma and a few others and bring those journalists in so that we can do some training and try to fill some of the gap that has uh, been created. This is Grayson in the Brahms parking lot um, with the water strip. 
Um, that's all that I have today, um, but you know, I would just encourage you more than anything is you know, be aware of what's happening around news and information in, uh, in your community. Um, the, uh, the First Amendment includes a variety of protections. One of those is freedom of the press, and if you look at religion, speech, the press, many of those are intertwined and dependent on each other. And so as uh, engaged um, citizens in, in your community, um, as Rotarians, I would just encourage you to, to pay attention um, to what's going on. If there's a place that you can be part of the solution, do that. But more than anything, I just wanted to provide some background. I'm happy to answer any questions about KOSU or um, this disruption um, as, of news and information. Um, and I would say, you know, the other thing, we've, we've redone this newsletter in the last year. I have this, uh, this thing here. Um, subscribe to the KOSU Daily Email Newsletter. It's a really interesting digest. Ryan LaCroix on our team puts it together every single day. And um, I think it's really, really good. Uh, so, um, and, and I, don't, I don't tell people all the time that things are good. So <laughs> I wouldn't lie. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Wasn't uh, a number of years ago, there was the opioid settlement in Oklahoma. That, wasn't that award-winning? Uh, material by KOSU journalists? Yes, uh, Jackie Fortier um, was our health reporter at the time. She's since been poached um, by- I know. Uh, I know, <laughs> by KPCC in Los Angeles. We still have a great relationship with Jackie and you can still hear her on NPR, but she was the only reporter from any news outlet who was in, that, in the courtroom every single day of that wow. trial. Uh, most people didn't have the resources to dedicate. We frankly didn't have the resources to dedicate, but we felt like that it was such an important um, thing that was happening in our state that, that we had to just really put someone there every day to be a witness to what was happening. Thank you. I got one, Rachel. Yeah. I know a couple, I think it was a couple months ago now, y'all were doing a big fundraiser because you had some towers damaged in the storm. I never heard, did y'all reach your goal? Did you get your towers repaired? Well, we're always fundraising, uh, but yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, we did, uh, we were able to, to fix, I don't remember precisely which, uh, which damage uh, to the towers that was. We're a little crossing our fingers um, for the cold because the last polar vortex that we had, the generator that keeps the thing up and running, um, started uh, spitting oil out of the exhaust. So our, uh, our engineer is like biting his fingernails waiting for the storm this week. Um, so yeah, I mean, towers are, uh, can be, you know, as Mike can attest, uh, towers can be finicky, finicky uh, things. Are you finding it difficult to reach the younger generation with the different platforms that they access digitally to get their information? I know my son is constantly sending me something on Reddit or, you know, they think they think for some reason Facebook and Instagram is the news and it's not. So what challenges and what are you doing to kind of overcome those to redirect them to where they can really get the news? So we've stopped trying to redirect them um, is, the, is the short story. Uh, we're just trying to, what we figured out is that it's much harder to say, hey, um, you know, my stepsons are, are 21 and, and 25, and so I, I see this all the time, um, but um, I, I can't get them to say, you know, hey, hey, Rafe, you need to go listen to the radio. He's not gonna do that. So if I can meet him, if I can meet him where he's at, um, whether it's on TikTok or it's on Reddit or it's on Instagram, with that information, so, it requires a lot more work on our reporters um, and our staff, but we're constantly trying to figure out how to translate information, whether you know it's the same story. So maybe it's about the elections that were happening across the state, um, Oakdale schools, there was a Beaver County election um, a couple of days ago, and translating that information so that it can exist on Instagram or exist on Reddit or exist on TikTok. I would say that we've made quite a bit of progress on Instagram. We still have a lot of work to do on Reddit and we have a lot of work to do on TikTok, but we don't feel like that we can show up. It's a capacity issue <laughs> um, that is challenging, uh, but I tell people all the time that we have to show up there consistently and we have to show up there authentically for that platform. And if we're not doing that, then it just rings hollow. And so we're trying to get in the place where we can deliver the news and, and information that is credible in those spaces, no matter what they are. Anything else? Thank you very much.
our club, as you can see in our, in our announcements, we believe in education. We'll be donating a book in your name to the Stillwater Public Library. Oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you for all you do, and thank you. I thought you were going to get to talk.